Okay. So, uh, let us jump straight in. What we have seen so far is that, wait. Neural networks can approximate pretty much any function. We have seen that in the past uh, uh, couple of lectures. You have also seen that in your quiz. But then it is all very fine. They can approximate any function. How do you make them approximate a specific function of your choice? So that is what we are going to deal with today and in the next couple of lectures, the next couple of weeks. So uh, this is the problem of learning. We're going to today specifically we're going to look at the perceptron rule for perceptrons and why you can't just use it for multilayer perceptrons. Uh, we the slides contain information on Adeline and Madeline, which are greedy algorithms to learn multilayer perceptrons. You will have to look these things up on the slides, but I won't have time to go, go over them in class. But then we'll look at empirical risk minimization and time permitting, we're going to spend some time on uh, function optimization and gradient descent. So here's a quick recap. We've seen that neural networks are universal function approximators. They can model any Boolean function, any classification boundary, any continuous valued function. Provided, again we saw this in the last class, the network has the structural capacity to model the, net, the, the specific function of choice. If the network is too small, you saw that it cannot model the function you want. Uh, properly, right? So in the various tasks that we saw the other day, uh, like uh, speech recognition or image transcription or playing games, whatever, something goes in, something comes out. So the overall process is that it takes an input, it produces an output, anything that does this as a function, it can be modeled by a neural network. The question is, how do you represent the input? How do you represent the output? I mean, a game state goes in, a game starts and a game a recommendation for the move to make comes out. Now these are very abstract concepts. They have to be represented in some numerical way for a function to operate on them. So one big question is how do you represent the input and the output so that this function can be computed? And then how do we compose the network that performs the requisite function? So this bit we are not going to be looking at today. That's later in the program, but we're going to spend all, we're going to assume that we know exactly how to represent the input, we know exactly what we want from the output, and we are going to focus on the network, how do you compose the network that performs the target function. Here's what the units in the network are. Again, we've seen this before, just for as a reminder, you have a weighted combination of inputs and a bias term. So you're going to compute this affine combination of the inputs affine because it's a weighted combination of inputs plus a bias. And then you have an activation function that operates on the affine combination of inputs. And we saw that the earliest models for the perceptron just used a threshold activation. If this weighted combination of inputs exceeded uh, a, uh, uh, was, was positive, if the affine combination of inputs was positive, the output was one, otherwise it was zero. But then we also saw you could use, once you sort of model the, uh, the uh, uh, unit in this manner, you could, you could use other activations like a sigmoid or this hinge function or the smooth and smooth version of the hinge function or other such functions. The, uh, so just for convenience, sometimes very often we won't explicitly draw this bias over here. You can think of the bias as just another weight and where you extend the input by an additional component, this value is always one. So here in this representation, Wn plus one is going to be the bias. I will sort of slide between the one representation and the other depending on what is convenient, but when I, when I write things like so, where I'm speaking of a linear combination of the inputs as opposed to an affine combination of the inputs, what this usually means is that there's a bias term as well, I'm just not explicitly representing it. So we've seen the individual units. What about the network of all of these units? The structure, we're going to assume a feed-forward network. What I mean by a feed-forward network is that when you're processing a specific input, every time a specific unit in the network processes that input, that input is not, go not going to come back to the same unit. The processing is strictly moving in one direction. 
no neuron ever sees any uh, input or any modified version of any input twice. So uh, we will be talking about loopy networks, but much later in the course. So part of the design of a network is the architecture itself. How many layers, how many neurons, etc. We are not going to get into that today. For now, we're going to assume that the architecture of the network is capable of representing the needed, needed function. In the previous class, we saw the restrictions on the architecture. As it turns out, deciding the optimal architecture for a problem is an art, it's not a science. And so we, we, won't, we won't spend much time on that in class, but you will in your homeworks. So the entire network can be looked at like this. It takes some input x, it produces some output y. Y could be a scalar, it could be a vector, it could be anything. And so this block over here can be thought of as a function f of x, and this function has some parameters. And what are these parameters? These parameters are the weights and the biases of the individual neurons in the network. So when, I'm speak when I speak of learning a network, what I'm really speaking of is learning these weights and biases, the parameters of the network. So moving on, questions? Okay. So we said the MLP can represent anything, which means I can build some network of this kind, which could technically represent this function perfectly. But the question is, how do you actually construct this network? Even assuming that the network has the appropriate number of neurons connected in the appropriate manner, how do I set the, do you mind shutting the laptop back there? Hello? Can you shut the laptop? Thank you. So uh, assuming that uh, I have actually got the, the structure, how do I set the weights and the bias, biases of the uh, neurons to actually make it compute this function that I wanted to compute. Now, one simple option is to just handcraft my network. We've seen this in the, uh, in the last class. So let's say I want a network which computes this function. I want the output to be one inside the diamond and zero outside. How would we do this? Do you remember? There are four sides, right? So I can actually have one neuron which computes, I'm again, this is the perceptron that I'm having. The output is one if this affine combination is positive, greater than or equal to zero, it's zero otherwise. So this guy is one perceptron which computes this line. So you can see that uh, firstly, the decision boundary is this line. So which means anything that's on this line should output a zero. The equation is x1 and uh, just for your reference, assuming I can find a chalk, that perceptron is going to be, uh, what's it? x1 minus x2 plus 1 greater than or equal to 0, right? So observe this plus 1. That, so the uh, uh, value shown against the red arrow is a bias term that I'm adding into the affine combination. And you can see that this indeed uh, satisfies the, this line indeed satisfies that equation. Also, if you consider this value, let's say x1 equals x2 equals 0, the origin. At the origin, the value of this function is just one. It's positive. So which means on the yellow side, this perceptron is going to output a positive number. On the white side, it's going to output a negative number. Similarly, I can do this something for this line. And here, again, the equation for this line is going to be minus x1 plus x2 plus 1 is 0. And once again, if you plug in the origin, into that equation, you're going to see that the output is 1, which means on the yellow side, the output is 1. On the white side, the output is 0. And I can do the same thing for this side and for this side. And so now I've composed four individual perceptrons, one capturing each side. And then here is the final one, which is the, su the uh, sum of these four outputs minus 4. The only time that output is 0 is when all four units fire. Otherwise, it's less than 0. So this network outputs a 1 inside the diamond and 0 outside. Very easy. You can handcraft it. Can you do this for every function? Obviously not, right? Most functions are way too complex, especially when you begin working in high dimensions. You don't even know what it is you're modeling. So although this is theoretically uh, uh, possible, it's practically not feasible. So we are not going to consider this anymore. More generally, you're going to be, if I were given this function g of x, and if I were told, now construct a neural network that can compute this function, then how would I go about doing it? Anybody? Want to take a guess? 
Anyone? So I guess not. Is that? Hmm. So you're talking about a more generic algorithm. But if I want to speak of an optimization procedure, what I would define is the, for any given, this is a function of weights, correct? So for any set of weights, that f is computing a function. Across the entire input space, I can define an error between the actual output of the network and the function that I want to compute. So if I, so for example, if I had this, depending on the, so let's say this is the input x, and let's say the input is just scale, the input is scalar for now, and maybe this is my target function. For one particular setting of w, the network may compute this guy, in which case I have all of this error, right? These are all errors. For a different setting of the weights, the network may compute something like this, in which case these are the errors. So I want to sort of find the set of weights such that over the entire space, this total area of this error region goes down to zero or is, or is minimized. So first, there are two things I require. First, I need to define some kind of a quantification of the error between what the network is actually computing and what I want it to compute. This is a divergence function. This has the property that it's always positive, and it's zero when g of x is exactly equal to f of x. And I want to, because that is just this height, I'm going to integrate it over the entire space so that it gives me the volume of the error area. And I, want, I will try to find the w that minimizes this guy. So this is how I'd actually go about optimizing any approximation, there's nothing magical about neural networks. If I, if, I, if I asked you to find a polynomial fit to a function, this is exactly what you would do, right? So what is the problem with this approach? G of x must be specified everywhere. I need to know G of x over all of, all of x. And that, of course, is not going to be given in practice. So what do we do? We're going to sample G of x. What I mean by sample g of x is that here is the function that I'm trying to model, but I'm going to compute, I'm going to take a bunch of locations in the input space and, comp and obtain the corresponding value g of x at those locations. So I'm going to get input-output pairs, many samples, where each sample is going to be basically an input and the corresponding function value, maybe with some noise. So these are what I will call my, uh, my learn my training points is a terminology we're going to get used to. But basically, at the end of it all, these are the only things that you have, those red lines, the x and the corresponding y. And uh, collecting such data is very easy for most real problems. For example, if I'm trying to perform speech recognition, I just want to compute, get speech recordings and their transcriptions. If I'm trying to perform image classification, I get images and their labels. It's just collecting natural data. But at the end of it all, these are all the things that you're going to get. And what you want to do is to try to learn this entire function from just these few examples, the training samples. So we're going to assume. So the way we will do it is that we are going to estimate the network parameters to make a perfect fit at these red points, because that's all the information that you have. And you're going to hope that when these red points fit perfectly, the rest of the function is OK as well. And then you can compute the function elsewhere. So uh, this, again, this is assuming that the network architecture is sufficient for such a fit. So here's the story so far. We spoke of learning a neural network, which is the same as determining the parameters of the network, the weights and biases uh, that are required for it to model a desired function. Ideally, we would like to optimize the network to rep represent the desired function everywhere over the entire space. But in practice, this would require knowledge of the function everywhere, which you won't want, have. So instead, we will draw input-output training samples, instances, training instances from the function, and estimate our network parameters to fit the input-output relationships, relations at these instances, and hope that the network, that, that the uh, network adequately represents the function at other points as well. Questions? Do you mind shutting your laptop at the back? Thank you. <laughs>
So let's begin with a simple task to learn a classifier. Classifiers are easier than regressions. So this was one of the earliest problems that people dealt with by using MLPs. Specifically, we're going to consider binary classification, where there are only two output classes. And this will generalize to multi-class classification later. So the simplest multi-layer perceptron is just a single perceptron. So here's the original uh, MLP. This was a network of threshold units. But the basic unit is just this simple threshold, uh, threshold uh, activated perceptron that we've seen. And the question is, how would you learn the parameters of a network of this kind where all of the units have the structure? Now, we're going back in history to the 18, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and, and even the 70s, where this was what a multi-layer perceptron was. The activation was a threshold unit. So how would you even try to learn it? Now, let's come to the simplest MLP. The simplest MLP is just a single perceptron. There is no network. So in this case, what kind of a function can a simple perceptron model? A simple perceptron is going to just model a linear decision boundary. As we saw, the function is going to look something like this. It's 0 on one side of a hyperplane, and then it goes up and becomes 1 on the other side of the hyperplane. This is the simplest function that we can actually model. It's a step function across a hyperplane, except you don't have the hyperplane itself. All you have is a bunch of points of this kind. And from these points, you have to figure out what the hyperplane is. So this is, this is where we are, we are down to. We are given input-output samples. We must compute the function. Right? Again, just for your reference, I keep writing this function out. Now, for convenience, I'm going to go back and do what I promised earlier. I'm going to assume that the bias is just another weight which means that the linear combination of inputs must be positive for the output to be positive, uh, for the output to be 1. Otherwise, it's going to be 0. Now, before I continue, just a, just a little bit of geometry. So anytime I have, say this was x1, x2, if I want an equation for a line of this kind, how would I actually get the equation for this line, for this hyperplane that goes through origin? Now, consider this equation over there. When I say summation wi xi, I can write w equals all of my weights. And then I can write x also equals all of my inputs. So now I have two vectors. And what you're really saying is w transpose x greater than or equal to 0. This is the actual. Uh, equation that we are looking at, right? Now, what does this mean? What is when is w transpose x equal to 0? When w is orthogonal to x. So really, that equation over there basically tells me you're drawing the w, and you're telling me, give me all the x's that are orthogonal to w. And that is going to be a hyperplane, right? Now. Another thing that happens is that suppose I have a point that's not on the hyperplane. If that point happens to be on the same side as w, what will the value of w transpose x be? Will it be positive or negative? It's going to be positive if it's x is on the same side as w. If it's x is on the, point in the other side of w, it's going to be negative. right? So we're going to use that. So we want to find the hyperplane here that perfectly separates the two points, except that uh, well, no except. Just keep in mind that uh, what we just spoke, right? So here's the, here's the rule that we're going to use. We're going to use a simple iterative algorithm. I'll start off with some plane, w. And let's say that I have an instance over here that's a positive. That instance is going to be misclassified, right? For that instance, what is the ideal weight, w? Remember, the instance would be positive. The instance is going to be positive if, the, if it is in the same direction as the weight, correct? So ideally, the best case is for the weight itself to be this guy, because then that's your decision boundary, and that's going to be a positive, correct? So what we will do is anytime an instance, positive instance, is misclassified, we're going to grab a hold of this weight, and we're going to drag it towards the positive instance, 
On the other hand, let's say I have a negative instance over here. Now that too is going to be misclassified, right? Now for the negative instance, here's the negative instance, the ideal weight would be pointing opposite to the negative instance, right? So anytime I encounter a negative instance that's misclassified, I'm going to grab my weight and I'm going to try to move it exactly opposite the negative instance. You'll see the intuition of what I'm talking about, right? So this is the little algorithm that we will have. If an instance is misclassified, if the instance is positive, I'm going to add it to the current weight. Because when I add it, that weight vector is going to get dragged towards the instance. If the instance is a negative instance is misclassified, I'm going to subtract it because then the weight vector is going to move away from the instance, right? And that is the entire perceptron algorithm. You randomly initialize the hyperplane somehow, and the classification rule is simply going to be the sign of W transpose X. Now, vectors on the same side of the hyperplane as W are going to be assigned plus one. Those on the other side are going to be assigned a minus one. And the random initial plane is going to make some mistakes. So it's going to call, for example, all of these reds, it's going to call them as plus one. This blue, it's going to call it a minus one, right? So I scroll through the instances and find my first misclassified positive instance. And once I find for any misclassified instance, let's say it's positive. Because it's positive, I want the weight ideally to point towards it. So I'm going to add this guy to the weight vector. And that's my new weight. And that's going to be my new classification boundary. Then I continue checking my instances. I find a misclassified negative instance. I want the weight to point away from it. So I'm going to subtract that vector from the weight. I get a new weight vector. And voila, I have a new decision boundary. Perfect. So if the training instances are all separable, meaning if it's possible for me to draw a hyperplane such that all the positive instances are on one side and all the negative instances are on the other side, this little algorithm is guaranteed to find you a plane that will perfectly separate the positive and the negative instances in a finite number of steps. In fact, the number of steps is going to be linear in the number of training instances. So if you start off with a zero vector, weight vector, then uh, here is the guarantee that you get that you're going to find the idea of the correct classification boundary after no more than r over gamma squared misclassifications, where r is the length of the, uh, yeah, r is the length of the longest training vector, and gamma is the best case distance, meaning the largest distance of training points of the closest training point from the decision boundary. If you're familiar with support vector machines, this is going to be the margin. So this is the guarantee that you have, that after no more than these many misclassifications, you can actually find the, class at the uh, decision boundary. So yes, this is a good problem. If I'm only working with one perceptron, and if I have linearly separable classes, and if, and if I have training instances from both of these classes, no big deal, it's going to be trivial for me to actually find a hyperplane that separates both classes. But then let's go back to the other problem that we had, which is this two polygon problem. I want to learn an MLP for this function. I want one in the yellow regions, zero outside, except I won't actually have the polygons. I only have the, uh, the, the dots. And I know that this classification boundary can be perfectly represented by this MLP. So I have the perfect structure, right? In this case, now, can I use the perceptron algorithm that we just saw to learn the parameters of all of these, or all of the network components? Now, the answer is no. Why not? Because here are the lines that I have to discover in order to be able to model this double pentagon, right? Now, consider this one guy. For me to be able to learn this one guy, what do I need? The perceptron algorithm only works so I, this, this line must give me a one on this side and a zero on this side, right? The problem is the training labels. Do I have a one on the right and a, zero, and a zero on the left? No. Many of the guys on the right hand side are actually blue, they're zero, right? So as a result, these, using this data, there's no way I can use the, percept, use the perceptron algorithm to, to determine this line. To find this, I actually need data which are labeled in this manner. Right? So what this means is that when I start off with something like this guy, these data, data points, and I want to find this line, 
which is the left side bottom boundary of my particular pentagon, I have to do two things. First, I have to figure out how many of these, which of these blue points I must flip to red so that now I can go ahead and find the line. So the problem is twofold. Just given red and blue dots which are separable, I can find, a, find the hyperplane. But if some of the red dots have been marked as blue, I have to figure out which of the red dots I have to convert, blue dots I have to convert to red so that I can find this line. And I have no prior information about it. So what I would have to do is to check every possible combination of the blue dots, flip it to red, find a hyperplane, de determine if I can find a hyperplane. If I can find a hyperplane, I keep it, then I have to do this for each of my neurons. Then I have to figure out if together they give me the target polygon or not. If they don't, I have to go back and repeat the whole process. So the, you must also learn the labels from the, for the lowest units, which means you have to try out every possible way of labeling the blue dots such that we can learn a hyperplane that keeps all the red dots on one side and such that as a unit, all of these guys give you the desired, uh, desired output boundaries. So this is clearly not a feasible thing because you're going to have to go over an search over all exponential combinations of inputs for every one of these hyperplanes. Test it out, and if it doesn't work, you're going to have to go back and repeat the process. This is an NP problem. It's an exponential search over inputs. It's not feasible. And so, uh, and, the re and the reason it's not feasible is that if you get any one, one flip wrong, you're not going to get the answer. Either the answer is perfect or you don't get anything, right? So uh, this is, I'm basically repeating myself, but uh, so, so, so you have this issue that uh, trying to simply learn all of the perceptrons, if I'm using threshold activations, in order to find the, all the parameters of my network, even assuming that my network is capable of modeling the function perfectly, is computationally infeasible. So given that it's computationally infeasible, can we come up with approximations? This is where Adeline and Madeline come in. These are algorithms, uh, these are greedy algorithms that uh, Bern Bernie Woodrow came up with uh, back in the 50s, and as it turns out, we still use them a whole lot in machine learning. I'm not going to go over them because we don't actually use Adeline and Madeline anymore for training neural networks. But please go over the slides. They are being referred to in your quiz, right? So here's the story so far. Learning a network is the same as learning the weights and biases to compute a target function. In practice, we learn them by fitting the network parameters to match input-output relationships of training instances. A linear decision boundary can be learned by a single perceptron in a finite number of steps if the data are linearly separable. Non-linear boundaries require networks of perceptrons, but then training an MLP with multi-layer threshold function activation perceptrons will require knowledge of the input-output relationship for every training instance, for every perceptron in the network, and these have to be determined as part of the training. So this is an NP-complete combinatorial optimization problem, yes. Yes, you're learning everything. B is also a parameter, right? So, so here is where things were after the 50s. That people realized that the MLP is very powerful. It can model pretty much anything. But there's a difference from can and does, between can and does. And we were stuck between, in the gap between can and does for, for, for several decades. Because, uh, you know, we've did, did people realize that training the entire MLP is a combinatorial optimization problem that cannot be solved? There were some attempts at coming up with greedy algorithms, but they don't really work on large-scale problems, and so things were pretty much stuck for, for quite some time. But then, let's go back, let's take several you know, decades, jump several decades forward to the 1970s. A guy called Paul Verbos in MIT asked this question, which is, uh, why am I unable to learn this thing? What is the problem? And the problem comes up, with, comes up to this. So suppose I have, give you these training points, right? And let's say, you see, the, can you make out this dark red line over here, the thicker one? 
So let's say I start off with the dark red line as my initial guess for the classification boundary. Now that dark red line is making a mistake. It's misclassifying this red guy, right? Now, do I need to rotate the dark red line left or do I, should, I, should I rotate it right? What do I need to do to make sure that this guy is also correctly classified? Clearly, I have to move it left, right? I have to rotate it leftwards. The top goes left. And eventually, it's going to put the red, red dot on the correct side. But then here is the problem. If I begin rotating this hyperplane, as I keep rotating it, what happens to the overall error? Does it decrease? No, the error stays the same all the way until you hit the red point and cross it. Right? So for a small change in the parameters, you have no idea of what is happening. Am I getting better? Am I moving in the right direction? Am I moving in the wrong direction? No clue. This means that you cannot, there's no way of actually sort of groping and finding a solution. And that's even for this very simple problem. But then suppose I actually make it something more complex, like this guy. Just multiply the whole thing by some tremendous factor, right? And so this is basically what keeps us from getting, uh, uh, from solving the problem. The problem is that the threshold function has two, two characteristics. A, where it does have a derivative, the derivative is zero. What do I mean by saying the derivative is zero? It means that a small change in my perceptron parameters creates results in no change at all, zero change in the error that we compute because the derivative is zero, right? And at the point where you cross a training instance, misclassified training instance, that derivative is infinite. You just hit it and then boom, the value changes. So either way, the function is not a very nice function. It's either not differentiable at all or the derivative is zero. So the threshold function is not a good func activation function to be using. There's another problem. Even assuming that my, prob my, my data are, that somehow I've magically managed to figure out how to deal with threshold functions, the perceptron algorithm only works if my data are linearly separable. That's not gonna happen. Very often you're gonna get stuff like this. You're going to get red dots on the blue side, blue dots on the red side. So, uh, then even the algorithm is going to kind of fail, right? So here's what we're going to uh, do to deal with both of these problems. Instead of having a threshold function as originally defined in all of the models for neural networks all the way until 1972, this is Paul Verbose's uh, contribution. Let's make this guy a differentiable version of the threshold function. Instead of making it a hard jump, let's make it go smoothly from left to right. So now what happens? But then once you begin assuming that you can use this, you can also think of other kinds of activations. So now what happens is these functions have the property that their derivatives are not zero everywhere. So this means that when the derivative is not zero, what is the derivative after all? The derivative is a measure which tells you if I change this parameter a little bit, does the output increase or decrease? So this can, you can actually use this factor to say how much should I be increasing this weight a little bit or should I be decreasing the weight? And so the way you would do it is you check the derivative. If I increase the weight and the error goes down, you want to increase the weight. If you, if you increase the weight and the error goes up, you want to decrease the weight. That information begins to uh, manifest the moment you actually have a differentiable, uh, differentiable uh, activation function. Now this is just for a single perceptron, but and uh, specifically, one particular activation function is really interesting, the one where we replace this threshold by this sigmoid. And it has a very nice interpretation. Why is that? Let's take a look. So this is a, this is a bit of a, an, an aside. So consider this two-dimensional example. This two-dimensional example, you're trying to learn this red function, except that the data you've been given are noisy. So you have some red dots suspended in the air. In the blue region, you have some blue dots sitting on the floor on the red region. So clearly the, 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 the data are not linearly separable. You can't use the perceptron algorithm. Let's look at a one-dimensional version of it. The one-dimensional version of it is going to look something like this. That you have some red dots in the blue region, you have some blue dots in the red region, right? The perceptron algorithm will not solve this. But then let's look at 
uh, a small window around the leftmost point. So, and count what fraction of training instances within this window have the value 1. And here it is 0. As I keep moving left, moving right, that fraction at some point begins to increase and then eventually it's going to become 1. So what is that fraction? That fraction is an estimate of the probability of encountering an instance with, uh, with y value 1 at each x. Because you're basically saying of all the instances that have an x value around this point, what fraction have the y value 1? So that's going to be an estimate of the probability of y being 1 for each x. And as you go left to right, you're going to end up get a curve of this kind. And that curve, this is the kind of curve, it's very typical in many problems. It, the same thing sort of generalizes to any number of dimensions. Uh, so here when it's a 2D variable, the sheet, the, the uh, curve, the curve you're going to get as you move perpendicularly to the decision boundary, the value is going to sort of, sort of go smoothly from 0 to 1. And the equation for this curve is the sigmoid, the logistic. So which is 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus the affine combination, which is what we saw uh, way back here. So this particular activation function has the nice characteristic that it somehow represents the probability of the output being 1 at each x. So we're going to return to the fact that perceptrons with sigmoidal activations actually model class probabilities in a later lecture, but for now moving on. So here's where we are. If I make my sigma z differentiable, now this means that I can tell you how, how a small perturbation of z, of z is going to affect y. But then z is just, a uh, is just a weighted combination of these inputs or an affine combination of these inputs. So that means I can in turn tell you how a small perturbation of this w is going to affect z. I can chain those two together and say I can tell, I can tell you how a small perturbation of w is going to affect y. So also I can tell you how a small perturbation of an x is going to affect z because z is just a weighted combination of x's. And so this means I can tell you how a small perturbation of x is going to affect the output y of the, of the unit, right? And then when I begin connecting these things up in a network, the whole thing kind of propagates. So now I can tell you how small changes in these weights affect this guy. I can tell you how a small change in the outputs of these neurons affects the final output, which means I can tell you how small changes in the weights of the edges coming into these individual perceptrons affects the output. And I can tell you how small changes in the outputs of these lower layer neurons is going to affect the output. I can move all the way down and I can literally tell you how small changes in every single parameter of the network is going to affect the output. That's simply because the activations became differentiable. So uh, this is just a bit of notation. I'm going to use this kind of notation. And again, uh, there's, there's, there's a thread for, uh, or there should be a thread for uh, errata in the slides on Piazza. If you find any mistakes, let me know. So I'm going to have weights represented like so, which is to say that this is a weight from the first unit in, and the superscript is the, is the uh, layer number. So Wijk is the weight connecting the ith unit of the kth layer to the jth unit of the k plus 1 layer, just for notation, right? And Yik is the output of the ith unit of the kth layer, sigma is just an activation function, it's differentiable, right? So here is, the, here is the overall process. Now if I think of this whole network as a function, it takes an input, it computes an output, this entire function is differentiable with respect to every single parameter of the network, which means I can tell you how changing every single parameter is going to change the output, and now I can do something about fixing the network such that it makes the smallest error on the training data. Right? So here's the overall setting for learning the MLP. You're going to be given a training set of input-output pairs, as we saw, where D is the desired output of the network in response to X. X and D may both be vectors. And we must find the network parameters such that the network produces the desired output for each training input, or at least a close approximation to it. We are going to say that the, net, uh, the, the network architecture itself is going to be specified by us. So remember, 
when we wanted to learn a function, if you had a g of x, what you were really trying to do is to find the w's that minimize this total error over the entire training space. But as it turns out, you don't have to consider the entire training space blindly. So let's say in your, in your data, in your problem specification, x never takes some values. Then there's no reason for you to be considering the error in regions where x doesn't go. So, so the way we will actually do it is you're going, to, you're going to weight each x with the probability that in the data that value of x actually occurs. So you want to reduce the, you're going to focus more on x's which are more frequent and less on x's which are less frequent. So the actual error that we want to minimize is this guy, which is the weighted average of the divergence function computed at every x. In other words, where the weight is the probability of x. So in other words, you want to minimize the expected value of the divergence between the function specified by the network and the actual function that you want to model. So, yeah. Uh, this is just error minimization. So it's still, you're still trying to approximate the function. The probability is only trying to give you some, uh, some, uh, some indicator of which, uh, you know, what to focus on. You don't want to spend too much effort adjusting Ws for Xs that never happen, for instance, right? So, so here's the, over but then we don't actually get the function G of X. So what we will really do is we're going to sample G of X. We're going to get input output pairs and when I say, now this is where the business of how to sample begins to factor in. How do I actually collect training data? And training data must follow the nature of the actual problem that you're trying to solve. So which means that you want to sample such that the x's that you get, the distribution of the x's that you collect, follows the natural distribution of x. If it's not representative, you're not going to learn things properly. And why is that? You will see that in the next slide. So what we're really going to do, this is what we want to do. We want to, mini, we want to minimize the expected value of the divergence between f and g. Instead, we're going to compute the average divergence between x and g computed over the training points. And provided your x's have actually been sampled from p of x, then the, the, this average divergence which we will call an empirical estimate of the divergence, is an unbiased estimator of this guy. What this means is that if you ran this experiment millions of times and then took the average of the error that you got over millions of different trials where in each trial you had a different training set, that average is going to look like this guy. So this is an unbiased estimate of this one. And so, because we can't actually obtain the actual expected divergence, we're going to use an unbiased estimate of the divergence, and that is what we're going to minimize. But for the unbiased estimate to be really unbiased, the training data must be sampled from P of X, right? So, this is empirical risk minimization. You're given a collection of training instances. On each training instance, you can compute the divergence between the actual output of the network and the desired output. You compute the average divergence over all of your training data. This is your empirical estimate of the expected divergence. And then you're going to obtain your weights W to minimize this empirical risk. So this whole process is empirical risk minimization. So again, remember that the empirical risk is only an empirical approximation to the true error. What we really want to minimize is the expected divergence over the entire space. What we are minimizing is the average divergence over a small number of samples. So there is no guarantee that minimizing this guy is going to minimize this guy. There's no guarantee at all. And in a later lecture, we will see the kinds of issues that can happen. But just to give you one simple example, so uh, for instance, if I have in my 2D case, I have training instances of this kind, Something that does this is also minimizing the error on my training instances, as does something that does this. And you have no way of distinguishing between the two. 
just based on your training instances. So this is why empirical risk minimization is just, it's, it's an algorithm based partially on hope that if you do the right thing on the training instances, it's going to do the right thing everywhere, okay? So here's the problem statement. You're given a training set of input-output pairs. We are going to define this empirical risk and we're going to minimize this with respect to the parameters W of the network. So this, we basically defined a function, error of W, it's a function of the parameters and we're trying to minimize this with respect to the parameters. So this is an instance of function minimization, more generally optimization. So here's the story so far. We learn networks by fitting them to training instances drawn from a target function. Learning networks of threshold activation perceptrons requires solving a hard combinatorial optimization problem. So we will use, we will use continuous activation functions with non-zero derivatives to enable us to estimate network parameters. Uh, we will also define a differentiable, again, this is very important, that the divergence that you define between the true output of the network and the actual output and desired output of the network, that divergence must also be differentiable. Now suppose you're only counting errors, classification errors, is that differentiable? No, counting is not differentiable because if I flip one point, the error is going to go from, you know, go up from zero to one. And if I don't, but there's, there's no notion of a sliding, right? So that is not a good divergence. Although an error count is a divergence, it's not a good divergence, it's not differentiable. You will not have any indication of whether, you know, changing a small weight is going to reduce the error or not. So we will define a differentiable divergence between the output of the network and the desired output. And then we're going to optimize the network parameters to minimize this error. And this is a an instance of function minimization. So another thing sort of pops out of this discussion is that even when we are defining the error between the actual output of the network and the desired output, we will make other approximations where the divergence function that we use itself is an approximation to the error that you actually want to minimize because the divergence must also be differentiable, right? Questions? Yes. Okay, so there are two different aspects. One is you want these, let me go back there. You want this activation to be differentiable. You want the activation to be differentiable so that you know how changing each parameter of the, of the network is going to change the output of the network. But that is not sufficient. Even if you change the output of the network, did it decrease the error or increase the error? You have no way of knowing unless the error measure itself is differentiable. Right? I, I say the, error, the output y went from 1 to 1.1. Did this decrease my overall error? Unless you can say that the overall, you can, you, can, you can quantify how much a small change in the output changes the error, that is not going to be helpful, right? So if my error is simply counting, I have 16 correct and 14 wrong in my classification, for instance. Changing the y from 1 to 1.1 may not change that count at all. So even the error function has to be differentiable. And so this divergence function that we define between the output of the network and the actual output that you want must also be differentiable. So there are the two aspects, yeah. The derivative, there, there is no derivative, that's correct. So you have a network, I mean, the thing is given a sufficient number of units. The, uh, idea, the, the, the hope is that even if some of them don't carry information, others will, right? But, but, the, but to, quant but to uh, get back to your point, these are the two different aspects of the problem that must be differentiable, right? So, uh, all right, questions, anybody? So what I'm going to do now is going to spend a few minutes on function optimization, what is the time? 919, right? 948. So we have some time, okay? Uh, so, first, I keep speaking of derivatives, right? Without looking at the slide, can someone, let me pick somebody, someone raise a hand. 
Anybody want to yes? What is a derivative? That's a, that's a very good answer, but it's very limited. Anybody else want to tell me what a derivative is? Yes. Yeah. Both of you are saying the same thing. Both of you are right, and I suppose that is the answer I'm looking for, but here. Yeah. So this is basically what we, does this go? Okay. So let's say I have y equals f of x. I'm not specifying whether x is a vector or y is a vector or anything, just some y equals f of x, right? So if I increase x from x to x plus delta x, right, y is going to go from y to y plus delta y. Because a small change in x will result in a small change in y. What is the relationship between this incremental change in y and the corresponding incremental change of x? So we are going to say that, the inc that for small enough incremental change in x, the relationship between delta y and delta x is simply this linear relation which says delta y equals alpha times delta x. This term alpha is what we will call the derivative. So for any function y equals f of x, x this, uh, the, uh, derivative is expressed is a multiplier alpha to a tiny increment delta x that gives you the corresponding increment in delta y. And this, this equation is based on the fact that if for a smooth function, if you get close enough to any point, eventually the function is just a hyperplane. So this is how you define the derivative. There is no other definition. If anybody asks you what a derivative is, this, the derivative is this multiplier alpha that must multiply an incremental change in x to give you the corresponding incremental change in y. This is going to be important to remember because in the next class or even today, right? So when x and y are both scalar, the derivative is going to look something like this. And here we will often write it as dy over dx. This is horrible, horrible, horrible notation. They inflicted us on uh, it on us in schools and uh, it's not a good idea. We also sometimes wrote it as f prime of x. Now there's a difference between writing something like this and writing something like that. And what is the difference? Yeah, this is, you know, you run into the, di the di division by zero problem, right? Uh, so it's not, it's not a very good notation. But anyway, now, so there's a small change in x, there's a corresponding small change in y. The relationship between the two is given by this multiply, which is a derivative, okay? What about for a vector argument? Now why writing things in this manner is important immediately becomes apparent when I begin looking at vector functions. So let's say I have a function y, which is a scalar, which is a function of a vector input, right? So if my x is a vector, what does delta x look like? Delta x is going to also be a vector, right? This is what delta x is going to be. But I can still write this equation, delta y equals alpha times delta x and alpha is still my derivative. And so in this case, because if y, delta y is a scalar, delta x is a vector, what will alpha be? It also has to be a vector, right? So it naturally falls out. And so alpha is going to be a row vector of this kind. And so the delta y is simply going to be, you know, if alpha one through alpha d are the components, it's alpha one delta x one plus alpha two delta x two and so on. These individual alphas, which are often represented, again, using this kind of horrible notation. These are called partial derivatives of y with respect to x. Why is it a partial derivative? This is the change that happens if you don't change the remaining x's, right? So here is how we're going to write this. For multivariate scalar functions, scalar valued functions, you still have the same thing, delta y equals the derivative times delta x. We're going to call this derivative the gradient. In my notation, the gradient is a, is a row vector. I mean, this is a matter of convention. Some conventions will call the gradient a column vector. That introduce, introduces all kinds of uh, issues when you begin speaking of applying chain rules and derivatives of larger functions because then you have to take some transposes and some not. So to, for consistency's sake, 
Again, this is also not an uncommon convention. The derivative is a, the gradient is a row vector consisting of partial derivatives. Okay, everybody clear? Yeah. So, in the following slides, I'm going to speak of optimizing a function with respect to a variable x. It's only a mathematical notation. In the actual network optimization problem, we'd be using network weights w. So, in the slides, x represents the variable that we are optimizing a function over and not an input to the neural network, right? Just don't get confused. I'm sort of abstracting the problem out. So let's say I have a function of this kind. Now this function has minima, it has maxima, it has inflection points where it sort of does that, right? Now observe that at minima and maxima and inflection points, everywhere the derivative is going to be zero. If you have a function that's nice and convex, then that's going to have a derivative that's zero at only one point. But for other functions, they can be anywhere. Now, the general problem of optimization, specifically minimization, is the problem of finding the x where this function f of x is minimum, right? Here in this case, it's going to be this point. Here, the function is minimum out here, so that is the point we're trying to find. And the way we would do it, we've seen this in high, sc in, in high school, you're given some function dy over dx, uh, uh, some function y equals f of x. And you are, we all know that the derivative is zero at a minimum because the function goes from decreasing, stops decreasing, and begins increasing. So at some point, it, it hits a point where it's neither increasing or not, not decreasing. That is the lowest value, right? And so the derivative there is going to be zero. So if I want to find the value of the function where, where it's minimum, I can just solve for this. And, and that's going to be, is it going to give me my minimum? No, right? So these guys are called turning points. Maxima and minima are called turning points. Why do, why do I call them turning points? Because if you stand at a turning point and move in any direction, you're always going to move the same way. So you're going to go up from a minimum. From a maximum, you're always going to be going down. And then these guys are not turning points, they're inflection points. At inflection points, in some directions, they're going to go down. In other directions, they're going to go up, right? So the solution is a turning point, but both maxima and minima are turning points. They both have zero derivative, right? So what we will do is, so if I were to plot the derivative at a maximum, the function goes from increasing and begins decreasing. So the derivative is initially positive and then becomes negative. At a minimum, it goes from decreasing to increasing. So the derivative is initially negative and goes to positive. And the point at which it's zero is either the minimum or the maximum. But if I looked at the second derivative, at the maximum, the derivative has a negative slope. So the second derivative is going to be negative. At a minimum, at a minimum, the derivative has a positive slope. So the second derivative is going to be positive. So the way we would do it is just look, we would first solve for uh, this guy find the location x where the derivative is 0, then check, check the double derivative. If the double derivative is, a, is positive, it's a minimum. If it's negative, it's a maximum. Now, this is all from high school, right? Nothing new. But then uh, you can have negative zero derivat derivatives at multiple uh, places, at maxima, at inflection points, and at minima. So what is the derivative at inflection points? At minima, it's positive. At maxima, it's negative. It turns out that the second derivative is going to be 0 at inflection points. Right? Now, if you have multiple variables, it gets a little more complicated. Now, let's look at functions of multiple variables. The optimum is still a turning point, right? because you're standing at this bowl, and walking in any direction is going to increase the value of the function. So if I'm trying to find the minimum, it's still a turning point. If I'm trying to find a maximum, that too is a turning point. So uh, this, but in this case, how do you actually interpret derivatives? When I say the derivative is 0, what does, it, what does the derivative really mean? So for that, let's take a quick look at what the, what, how to interpret the derivative of a multivariate function. So again, going back, the gradient is, this was how we defined the gradient. The gradient was the multiplier to an infinitesimal increment in x that gave you the corresponding increment in y, right? So if I write it out, this gradient was a row vector consisting of partial derivatives. And dx was a column vector 
So, this product is a vector inner product. This we agreed, right? Now, the vector inner product has a very specific characteristic. So, what is the vector inner product between u and v? This is a formula you're all familiar with. The inner product between u and v is the magnitude, magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cos theta. So, suppose I fix the length of u and v, right? When is this inner product maximum? When theta equals 0. Both of them are pointing in the same direction, okay? So, let's say I fix my partial derivative. I fix my gradient. And then I fix the length of my step, delta x. I can rotate x in various directions, right? And keep the length. In which direction must it point for this inner product to be maximum? Anyone? The, this value, the gradient times delta x, is maximum when delta x is pointing directly in the direction of the gradient. Right? So in other words, the gradient is the direction of the fastest increase of the function. Right? Clear to everybody? Right? So if I look over here, I can compute partial derivatives and you know, and in various directions, but this guy, this is the direction in which I must walk for the function to increase fastest. So this guy is the gradient. Moving in this direction increases x faster, ff fastest. And the vector minus of the gradient is the direction in which the function is decreasing fastest. So that is the direction of fastest decrease of f of x. And again, at these turning points, the gradient is going to be 0, right? There's one more feature that comes in, which is that if I draw a level curve on any function, the, level, the gradient is always going to be perpendicular to the level curve. Again, this is trivial to prove, but uh, this, is, this is something that's worth remembering because it, because it affects some of the things that we do. There's yet another uh, feature that of derivatives of scalar functions of multivariate inputs which is the Hessian. The Hessian is the second derivative. It's like a second derivative, but in this case, it's a matrix where the diagonals are the second partials with respect to individual parameters, and the off diagonals are the partials with respect to pairs of parameters. If this is going to be a symmetric matrix. So if you look at the slides, you'll see something else. Please look at the slides. The Hessian has a very specific property which has to, which affects whether the location where the gradient is zero, is zero is a minimum or a maximum or something in between. And just to make sure that you actually look at the slides, I've included multiple problems on this in the quiz. Now, returning to direct optimization. If I want to find the minimum of a scalar function of a multivariate input, the optimum is a turning point, the gradient will be zero, so I can just solve for the gradient. Now, solving for the gradient won't tell me if it's a maximum or a minimum. So now I can compute the Hessian matrix if the Hessian matrix is positive definite, which means all the eigenvalues are positive, then I have a local minimum. If the Hessian matrix is negative definite, which is to say all the eigenvalues are positive, I have a local maximum. And if the Hessian is, uh, uh, is indeterminate, meaning some eigenvalues are positive, some eigenvalues are negative, it means that in some directions I have a minimum, but in other directions I have a maximum. So I have a saddle point. Right? So, now, I could solve for this, but this means I'm assuming I'm solving a closed form equation. You're not always going to get a closed form solution. So often it's simply not, po not possible to simply solve for the gradient of x equals 0. So here we're going to require iterative solutions. You begin with a guess for the optimal x and refine it iteratively until the correct value is obtained. So you could say start off over here from an initial guess and then update it to a hopefully better value of f of x and meaning you keep modifying x to decrease x, f of x, and then you stop modifying it when f of x no longer decreases. Now the question is which direction to step in and how, how, how big must, be, must the steps be? So uh, here's what we observe. So let's say I'm at this location. I can look at the gradient. The gradient tells me how much a small increase in x is going to increase, affect y. So if the gradient is negative, what does it mean? It means increasing x decreases y, right? So over here, if the gradient is negative, 
it means I want to move forward, I want to increase x. If the gradient is positive, it means increasing x increases y. So I want to take a step backward, I want to take a step against the gradient. So uh, you start at some point and if you have a positive derivative at that point, you move backwards. If you have a negative derivative, you move forwards. And so here's, how, here's the solution that you'd get. You'd have some initial x0. And while the derivative is not 0, if the derivative is 0, you sort of hit some kind of a local minimum or, the, or a saddle point, right? So if the sign is positive, then you take a step back. If the sign of the derivative is positive, you take a step back you're, because you're moving, you're decreasing x. If the sign of the derivative is negative, you take a step forward because moving forward decreases x, uh, decreases y, right? But then what is the step size? I can rewrite the same thing. I can say, uh, instead of writing it in two steps, I can just say while the derivative is not zero, I'm going to say xk plus one is xk minus the sine of this guy times step. So again, observe that if the sine of this guy is positive, then I'm taking a step back. If the sine of this guy is negative, I'm taking a step forward, which, is, which follows our intuition, right? But then instead of looking at the sine itself, I can suck that sine and simply directly multiply this with the derivative. And now you're left with this one magic term, which is the eta, which is the step size. Right? So this is going to be the iterative trivial algorithm for finding a minimum for complicated functions. So this is what you call the gradient descent algorithm. Now we saw this for a scalar function, but for multivariate functions, it's basically the same thing. You're going to start off with an initial guess, and at each point, you're going to, if, uh, if you want to find the ma maximum, you're going to walk in the direction of the gradient. If you want to find the minimum, you're going to walk against opposite the direction of the gradient, because as we saw, moving exactly opposite the gradient decreases the function fastest, right? And then you have a step size. So there are many uh, solutions to exactly how to find the step size. So here is the, uh, now, when do you stop? Ideally, you stop when the gradient is zero, but very often, you want the gradient won't actually just go to zero. So you would typically say if the change is between subsequent steps is very small. I've hit some kind of a local flat region, I'm not going to move any further. So here's the overall gradient descent algorithm. You initialize x0, and while the differences between the value of the function, yes? We'll get back to this in the next class, or in a couple of classes. But uh, so I'm sort of glossing over this because we're going to spend a lot more time talking about step sizes and such like. But then, so here is the overall thing. While the change in the function value is greater than some threshold, if you're trying to minimize the function, at, you start at some point, take a step against the gradient at that point, then, then at that location, check the gradient, take a step against the gradient, keep doing this till this criterion is met, right? So I'll stop right here. In the next class, we're going to see how we would apply this to train a neural network. We're going to look at back propagation. And then the class after that, we will begin looking at step sizes and what additional heuristics you may require to actually make the thing learn a function properly. Questions? Yes? This one? Yeah. So these x's are the only training instances, on, only information you have. So I can have one network which computes the smooth curve, and another network which computes this ugly thing. Yeah. And both of them are going to give me zero error on the training and training data. Which one do you want? Smooth. Yeah, but so the point is, are you sure? sure? Exactly. So the only information you have is the training instances. Thank you. Thank you.